So now we're going to switch gears um, and talk about some tools, um, which is something that um, OCOW and um, the Occupational Disease Action Plan, which we're going to talk about later, something we're always uh, striving to do is to offer um, offer tools that help workplaces and workers um, decide what could be hazardous and um, and and do something about it in, in order to... Um, so first I'm going to introduce John Audick, who's going to come and talk about... First he's going to talk about a survey that we did uh, this year, um, a national survey about hazards that people are exposed to in the workplace. And then... Um, then and then actually introduce a new app because it wouldn't be the fall if we weren't coming up with another app and this one um, is one that um, John has long advocated for and uh, I think it will be a very useful uh, hazard communication tool in the workplace and yeah as I talk I hopefully anybody that's on the stairs there are some uh, some seats on the uh, west side of the room and there's some more seats at the front if uh, if people want to move so John you know how to get to your presentation I guess yeah, we could find it here. Let's see. Um, in the folder. I assume if it's not up, is it up? No. Um, oops, sorry. I can't see it. So do you know which one of those is yours? Uh, A national survey and app intro, uh, that would be it. Yep. And then we want to... It. Slideshow, huh? You want to steer? There we go. Okay. Thanks, John. Yeah, watch our safety hazards up here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I didn't pick this title, <laughs> so uh, I broke it down into uh, other steps. That was my title for the first part, anyway. Uh, just a bit of background. Um, last year, the end of December, um, Michael Roche uh, came up with the idea of doing some type of a national survey of uh, exposures, workplace exposures. And I talked to Victoria Arendale and Peter Smith of the IWH and a number of other people. And we came up, uh, well, I came up. Um, any uh, criticisms belong to me, not to those people. They, they give their advice freely. <laughs> um, with this list of uh, uh, sources of exposure, we use the um, exposure scales from uh, Peter Smith's vulnerability survey. And we liked the pattern of his questions, so we added some uh, extra questions about that. We also looked at uh, sun exposure and wet work. Uh, we've done a lot of work with indoor air quality and ergonomics in office, uh, so that's uh, some work that came from ourselves. Um, as occupational health clinics, we see individuals uh, who have reactions in the workplace, and so we were interested in asking about that. We also use the IWH's uh, organizational performance metric, the OPM, uh, and then we also had our own questions, which came from Stress Assess, about uh, concerns about workplace exposures. So we uh, contracted a company called ECOS, and uh, they did the survey at the end of March. Uh, the study criteria included anyone who uh, worked, was working in a workplace with six or more employees. It was available in English and French. We focused on Ontario, Quebec, Alberta, and British Columbia. And uh, the data was also uh, compared to the um, labor force survey for February uh, from Statistics Canada and then adjusted for age, gender, and region. So the IWH vulnerability measure has uh, four scales in it and one of them is the hazard exposure and that's the one we used. Um, we adjusted the, uh, the scale a little bit, um, so we used a few times per week or more, and uh, the most dominant exposure was repetitive motions, over 60%, standing for more than two hours, and uh, work in bent and twisted, awkward positions. So obviously there's a lot of work for ergonomists uh, to do. Um, also, 21% uh, were exposed to noise levels that uh, uh, meant they had to uh, raise their voice if they were more than an arm's length away. Uh, 
Also, 15% uh, interact with hazardous substances, um, manual lifting, again, ergonomics, 15% working at height, and 6% actually um, perform tasks that uh, they were not familiar with, even though as part of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, it's uh, the responsibility of the supervisor and the employer to make uh, people familiar with uh, these things. We also uh, added some extra questions along uh, the same pattern for gases and vapors and solvents, smoke fumes, powder, uh, dust, exhaust, and specifically diesel exhaust. Um, we also ask questions about asbestos. Uh, have you ever disturbed asbestos in, in your building? And 1.4% uh, actually did. Um, but 43% of people didn't know whether they had asbestos in their building or not. And this speaks to some of the efforts of people to try to get a registry of buildings uh, that have asbestos so that people will know. Uh, when it comes to engineered nanoparticles, though, um, the uh, ignorance was even larger. 91% either didn't know what an engineered nanoparticle was or whether they were present in the workplace. And if you do know what they are, um, there's probably in this room. So uh, we assume that they're almost in every workplace. Uh, we ask questions about sun. Here again, um, people who are exposed to the sun in outdoor work Yet 40% uh, seldom, rarely, or never use sun protection. And exposed to light at night, 20%. Would be interesting to compare this to the, the Carex uh, information. And uh, having hands immersed in, in a liquid more than two hours a day, uh, almost 10%. And then uh, for the ergonomics of office type environments, um, uh, we talk about uh, sedentary work uh, being the new smoking. 58% um, uh, spend more than four hours a day uh, in a seated position. And 11% of those uh, find that their workstation is uh, annoying or un very uncomfortable. Um, frequently or always uh, distracted by noise was almost a quarter of the respondents. and. Um, Air quality was rated as poor or worse by 8.5% and uh, odors 8.1. Uh, be interesting to see how they, those two overlap. Um, if you do detect odors, um, what we found was about 15% of people uh, reported that it causes discomfort and mild symptoms or significant symptoms or causes symptoms so severe that they occasionally miss work. And when we ask people whether they have any uh, allergic reactions to uh, anything in the workplace, again, uh, we recognize that what people say is allergic reaction is not necessarily what a doctor would say is an allergic reaction, but 20% is uh, um, quite surprising. And do you use medication to alleviate symptoms caused by workplace exposures? 7.5% uh, use it at least weekly. Uh, if you add the uh, couple times a month, it's 12%, which we also found um, quite significant. Now, the IWH um, organizational performance metric, it's uh, a, a bit of an awkward question. Um, you're asked to assign percentages uh, to um, uh, how often that practice takes place in your workplace and then they're assigned uh, numbers from zero to four. And uh, anything over a three is interpreted as performing well overall. Anything less than two is uh, needs improvement and in between is uh, needs some improvement. So uh, here are the scores. Um, the uh, the interesting thing, these are the good scores uh, over three, and uh, the bad scores are less than two. And you'll see that, for instance, the, the, um, the last question there, those who, who act safely receive positive recognition. 71% uh, of the respondents said that was the case, but 
almost 29% uh, said uh, that was not the case. And so you have nobody in the middle, whereas for some of the other ones, uh, for instance, the first one on the top, number, question number eight, 55 and 11%, that leaves a lot of room in the middle. Uh, so the ECOS average scores uh, are shown here from, from highest scores to lowest. And the IWH average scores, uh, which they use online for uh, reference, uh, are there. And you can see that our scores are significantly lower, except for um, uh, the formal safety audit question. But I think that's because when the IWH did the survey, they asked people who were responsible for health and safety, usually the management person, whereas this is just asking uh, anyone. So in our own uh, surveys for stress assess, we have, uh, we ask questions about concerns uh, about uh, hazards and environmental conditions and we co code them into uh, three areas of concern. Uh, yellow is concern, uh, brown is annoyance, and pink is interferes with the work being done. And we have 12 different uh, hazards that people uh, were asked to rate. And psychosocial hazards uh, was the most um, commonly endorsed uh, one, followed by thermal comfort and ergonomics. Um, we compared this to our previous survey in 2016 where we asked similar questions, but uh, they were asked of all provinces, whereas uh, now we're just looking at four provinces, so they're not perfectly uh, comparable. But uh, that's what, kind of the frequency of what we've done so far. We're also looking at coding uh, economic sectors and comparing them, jobs, uh, the provinces, looking at how this compares to the CAREX, uh, occupational exposure data, break it down by demographics, look at uh, any correlations or factor analysis. And if you have any ideas, please bring them up and uh, we'll have a look at them. Now, out of that, uh, we created a, a tool um, called Hazard Assess, designed to help workers identify and report hazards. And it runs through that checklist of 12 hazards I just described you know, with the, using the same scale. But we're also asking people to report any symptoms they experience during those exposures. And also identify the cause and suggest um, ideas for um, fixing the problem. Uh, the app also allows people to have pictures, take pictures, and they can be attached and you can draw circles and arrows. And those who know uh, are as old as me and know Alice's restaurant know where that quote comes from. Uh, results can also be emailed to the supervisor, health and safety rep, the Ministry of Labor, anyone you have an email address for. And the idea is that it's a tool to facilitate the IRS process. So here's what it looks like when you open it. Uh, there's a list of the 12 um, hazards, and then for each one, you do a rating. So for instance, are there any concerns about the way uh, exposures to radiation? And uh, here we have the Wi-Fi is not strong enough, and the health effect is frustration and stress. And uh, the solution is uh, make get stronger Wi-Fi. You might laugh, but this is uh, actually a, a, an answer that I did get from, from somebody's uh, survey once. And then how well are um, uh, dangerous chemicals handled? So I thought I'd apply it to my office. And in my office, I have asbestos, paraformaldehyde, <coughs> hydrogen chloride, and uh, an industrial strength cleaner. And um, so, uh, you know, the typical um, response if you have a problem at the bottom of the hierarchy of controls is wear a mask. So here's a picture I took and with my circles and arrows and uh, here's also a picture of the asbestos. Notice it's in a plastic bed. Um, I use it for demonstrations. And uh, the wear a mask, so there I am sitting at my desk with a mask. <laughs> And health and safety, you can use the pictures uh, 
uh, for different things. So uh, I noticed that when I looked at the picture, my desk looked cluttered. I never <laughs> noticed that. Um, so I can use the same picture again. Then in the end, you get a re result. Uh, each are color-coded to um, the level of concern that you have. And uh, there's, uh, there's the scale that it's interpreted. But if you click on each one, you get some ideas on how to uh, address those hazards. And also, you can uh, send an email. So you generate a PDF report, and that can be attached to an email sent to my supervisor. <laughs> And, yes, that's just out of your office. <laughs> and there are also additional resources. So if you uh, click on the link, you go to uh, some resources, like here for chemicals or for health and safety hazards. Um, the CCUH, CCUHS um, resources are available. The one thing we had in our survey also was, uh, at the end, a question about, uh, is there anything else you, you want to talk about or any exposure you're most concerned about. And what was fascinating to us is the dominant question, we're asking about all kinds of exposures, and the one thing that most people want to talk about in the comments was stress. And so uh, since Paul had a little plug uh, for his name, I thought I'd put a little plug in for stress assess. Um, but uh, October is actually uh, kind of an anniversary, not only for um, for OCAL, the 30th anniversary, but the 40th anniversary of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Uh, and I found this out by going to the Facebook page of the Ministry of Labor. And I found out uh, not too many people are visiting it, but uh, they had a nice picture uh, from back from 1979. Uh, again, just like Paul, it's probably not a politically correct uh, picture of the workforce, but that's the way we looked in 1979, I guess. And then uh, you also have your uh, little green book. And uh, I thought, I'm old enough, uh, I have one that's way, way back when. Also, uh, I have the, uh, the bill. I started working uh, before Bill 70 came into an effect. Uh, with all the scribbling in it. And uh, as a curiosity, I also have the yellow book, which was prior to the green book. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than the green book. But uh, I think it's important to go back and to remember that all this comes from the Ham Commission, which again comes from the strike of the Elliott Lake miners. And uh, what Ham, uh, when he had his royal commission, he actually flew to uh, Sweden and uh, looked at some of the uh, processes there and was very impressed with the ideas of industrial democracy at the time. And he was convinced that economic success depended on cooperation and uh, good safety performance. He, he actually said in uh, an IAPA conference, which I attended in 1983, law is the conscience of those who have none. And I thought, wow, have things ever changed? Ham's view of the internal responsibility system was based on the principles of natural justice, that people had the right to know, participate, and to refuse. But the right of participation was defined as uh, having sufficient knowledge, uh, having a contributive uh, responsibility, and a direct responsibility. So workers management and the Ministry of Labor have all three modes of participation. But his idea of health and safety reps, or worker auditors, as he called them, only had the first two. So the worker auditor w was, was there to investigate and address specific incidents and issues, but he thought a more mature worker auditor would uh, function at the higher level at policy issues. So they would kind of be an auditor of the, the internal responsibility system. They aren't the internal responsibility system. They monitor its health. Uh, however, in 1990, uh, um, Bill 208 gave some direct responsibility to health and safety reps to stop work that they thought would be immediately dangerous. This is the, uh, on the Ministry of Labor, um, internal responsibility, or facts, uh, frequently asked questions, uh, their definition. 
Uh, what's interesting here is each person takes an initiative on health and safety issues and works to solve problems and improvements on an ongoing basis. But because of power imbalance, not everybody has the ability to act on what they think they should do. And therefore, there's um, the health and safety uh, representatives who represent them. And so we talk about rep styles of representation. And Alan Hall did uh, some studies back in uh, the early 2000s where he interviewed a number of uh, CAW, Unifor now, um, health and safety reps, and came up with uh, two types of representation, the technical legal representation and the politically active. And the technical legal representation was the style that looked uh, they had to look into the book and said, well, if it's in the book, uh, I can do something about it, but if it's not in the book, sorry, uh, that's the rules, we can't do anything about it. The politically active representative understood that uh, there was able, they were able to organize workers and uh, it was a function of power and political influence rather than just the technical uh, what's written in the book. So they were able to get things, uh, much like the wildcat strike in um, Elliott Lake in 1974, which brought us the Occupational Health and Safety Act. But when they did this survey, they found out there was another group, um, a more effective subgroup of political activists who used knowledge strategically. And he called these knowledge activists. And uh, they were... Uh, not as table thumping as the political activists, but uh, they gathered information, made the case, uh, came up with a solution, and then confronted uh, uh, the powers that be in order to make things change. Uh, we've done a follow-up survey on that. Uh, we found out the political activists are pretty well extinct, uh, but the knowledge activists are very strong. And we put together um, this, this booklet uh, which is available online, hard to find though. Uh, and it has a set of uh, principles on uh, effective participation and representation. Things like research, uh, uh, doing more than just going to meetings, mobilizing your influence, listening to workers, addressing authority, building trust, uh, being assertive, building solutions, using inspections and minutes and the law strategically. and. Uh, Oh, five minutes, I got five minutes to spend on one slide. <laughs> okay, um, and this is the prevention framework that, uh, is the laser here or did Paul? <laughs> okay, um, I just want to, the, the, um, the hazard assess app is kind of uh, focused on uh, primary prevention and secondary prevention, but at the individual, the group and the organizational level, and also, uh, because we're asking about symptoms and things like that, uh, it's, it's kind of a secondary um, prevention also. And so it's, it's the old idea of the canaries. And uh, many of you uh, here uh, probably know Dave Verma. And uh, he was uh, at McMaster. Uh, and he's an industrial hygienist, a professor. And he also worked at the WSIB. Um, I was talking to him a while ago and he described to me when he started his work in, in the mines in Wales, in England, uh, as an engineer, they made engineers start off and do every job in, in the mine. And one of the jobs he had to do was uh, carry the canary from place to place in the mine. And the idea was when the canary keeled over, it was time to get out. Uh, and in a sense, um, the type of prevention we're, we're looking at when we're getting involved in workplaces is often there's a person who will react first and they're often labeled the sensitive one or, or something like that. And rather than see them as the canaries, uh, sure, if a person has sensitivities already, they're the perfect canary because if they start reacting, there's something there that needs to be done. And if you ignore it, later on others uh, will start to react and uh, you can keep blaming uh, the individual but it's a signal for you to uh, look for something and when we started uh, the clinic uh, we had a, a nurse who had asthma and um, 
it was great taking her along into the workplace because if she reacted, I knew something was there. <laughs> and uh, she was our canary. Anyway, um, thank you for listening. And uh, I hope uh, the app is not ready yet, but it was supposed to be. But you know how programming works. Uh, but it will be ready soon. Thank you. Transition to uh, Thomas. Here's a thank you note. Thank you. Any questions? Anybody have any questions for John about the um, about the app or the survey? I did want to mention I didn't uh, print off, but we are actually uh, hosting an event about knowledge activism and about. Um, the translation of knowledge for activation in the workplace as part of the Oak House 30th anniversary in Hamilton on November the 22nd. And it's on Eventbrite right now if anybody uh, is interested. I don't know if we're... Sorry about that. Uh, uh, does anyone have any questions or... Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that they can follow us on social media if they want updates about the app that's upcoming. Yeah. That's a great idea, Vani. And, and we will um, email everybody here when it's live as well, everybody who's uh, subscribed to the, um, to the session today. Okay, uh, Dr. Thomas Tenkade is going to talk about um, a chemical hazard uh, tool that they are developing at Ryerson. Thanks. I don't know how to get it. Uh, down here at the... Down there? No, I don't think we have it open. We have to go down here to the... Uh, Sorry, I should. Next time we'll get it all up. Each up okay. presentation, and then you there can open them all if you want. Those. So as soon as you say I'll to run, those, uh, yeah. down here, I think if you click on that thing, there. Great. Okay, thanks. great. Thanks very much, Val, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Um, I've just got a few slides, and then uh, I'll demonstrate our. Uh, our current uh, electronic tool. So basically, I'm going to talk about a, a small project that we've been uh, involved in called Chemical Hazard Assessment and Prioritisation. Um, so the background is that uh, we, we uh, basically wanted to develop a tool that could help small business. And, and that's really the key, is it's about small business and, and how can we help them better understand the hazards associated with the chemicals that they're using and can we have a way to help them prioritise what the most hazardous chemicals or products are for, for, as a starting point for future uh, risk assessment. Uh, and so one of, when we were thinking about this, where do small business get their information for chemicals? The, really the prior, primary way is through, this, through safety data sheets. And so is, was there a way that we could use safety data sheets or information in safety data sheets as a way to help uh, small businesses, say businesses that may not have any OC, OC health and safety personnel or they might have a half-time person, uh, or, and, and also maybe using through, or say through the Joint Health and Safety Committee, how can we help people in those roles to really understand uh, what what the levels of hazard the various chemicals they have are. And so really it's a screening tool. Could we provide a screening tool for hazard assessment as the first stage of a full risk assessment? And so we, uh, we've called this CHAP, so uh, Chemical Hazard Assessment and Prioritisation. This is the sort of broad steps of the process. So, so we established a research team to start with, and we so there was the researchers from Ryerson, myself, Desiree, and Peter. But then we, uh, through a process of engagement, we were able to engage with uh, five unions and three safety associations, including OCAL, uh, and Val was on. Val was gracious to be on the team, and so we we uh, established our research team. We then had a two pronged approach of recruiting workplaces as well as developing this tool and also developing a training process. And so re the recruitment process took quite a long time and we uh, took nearly a year to get six workplaces. Um, we then went through a pre-evaluation meeting uh, a stage, uh, a training meeting, and then the workplace uh, trialled the uh, CHAP tool and then we did, uh, met with them again with a post-evaluation 
And, and basically with this process, we were using a paper version of, of this tool. And our, an outcome of the uh, evaluation was maybe this would be really good if it was an electronic, something electronic. And so then the question was, well, uh, what sort of electronic uh, process could we use? And seeing this was, when, and so thinking about small business and what could they, and because this was really more of a desk-based activity, maybe let's look at something to do with using Microsoft Excel. Most, most, people, most uh, people have some familiarity with Microsoft Excel. That it's a standard, standard software. So could we use Excel as a, as a, uh, a platform for people to do this uh, hazard assessment? And so, so that's what we've done. We've developed two tools. Uh, one tool is a basic tool and one is a more an advanced tool. And we're in, now in the process of trialling these uh, electronic CHAP tools. And I'll show, show you some of those in, in a minute. The, uh, the basis of the tool design is, is using hazard banding. And I know that there's another uh, talk about that uh, coming up. And, and basically this is uh, classifying hazards into categories based on hazard bands. Band A is the lowest hazard, band E is the highest hazard. Uh, our focus for us was on health hazards. And so what we did was say, well, what, what's already out there? And there's basically uh, five products or, 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 uh, that are out there that we, we reviewed, the Kosh Essentials, International Chemical Control Kit. Uh, at the time, it was the draft NIOSH Occupational Exposure Banding Process. There's an a online uh, tool called Stoffen Manager. And then there's a, 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 a research publication by a group, a group na uh, uh, led by a person named Arnone. And so, so we looked at all of those five uh, approaches to hazard banding. And then we combined it with an approach that I'd used previously for chemical safety, chemical hazard assessment. And, um, and so we end up choosing the, the process or the approach by, by Arnone uh, over the others, mainly because of the more simplicity of it and the perspective that we're looking for something for small business. And can they get everything they need to do the process directly out of their safety data sheet? And so safety data sheets under the uh, GIS, the Globally Harmonised uh, uh, System for, for Chemicals, are required to have uh, standardised hazard statements and, hazard, uh, that, and the statements have defined hazard codes. And these are uh, describing the toxicological characteristics of the substance uh, and these are listed in section two of the safety data sheet. So basically what we're wanting to do is say, can we take those that, is inf that information out of the safety section two out of the safety data sheet, plug it in to a process and come up with a rating of how hazardous this chemical was. And so that's pretty much what we did. Um, so I uh, just wanted to, just some feedback from the workplaces who trialled the, the paper version. Uh, I've, obviously I've only put up the, the positive com comments, you know, I didn't want you to see any of the negative comments. But uh, basically, you know, they, they said, uh, we like the idea of, so our process was let's take the top 10 chemical, or you identify the top 10 chemicals you have, the f top five based on the, the, the quantity that you use, and the top five that you think are the most hazardous as a starting point. And so, so they like that idea of, of having that as a starting point. Uh, they, uh, uh, and one of the things that we sort of felt was that the, a positive with this is that it, it basically uh, got small work, workplaces into uh, sort of updating their safety data sheets. It got them reading the safety data sheets. It, it got them to sort of investigate what was actually in the safety data sheets. And I think, and uh, you know, as some of these statements here, you know, I've, I've now gone through as many safety data sheets as I ever have done. I was surprised to find out how much how hidden the words were. You know, that was one comment. So, so it got people to actually read their safety data sheets, what I think is a, is a plus, as a, as a good starting point. And um, so, so these are just some of the, some of the feedback. Um, just to, I just wanted to highlight that uh, we've, we, uh, we had our, uh, our research partners and the, the project was funded by uh, the Ministry of, Ministry of Labor. So that's uh, a brief overview. I want to now try and get to the an example here. Yeah, it's in the folder. 
I think folder. this one, oh, they said it. to sort of pull it. A, so I've got to try and pull it across. Wait a minute, this way? Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, there we go. You made two. So, so basically what I'm going to show you, if I can sort of control it here and see it over there, is this is a, a Excel spreadsheet. And this is, so we have two versions. One is a, a basic version using 10 chemicals. This version here is our advanced version where a workplace can do an infinite number of chemicals. And so the process is that uh, there's a, uh, oops. Oops, let's see. So, so there's basically they have a summary sheet where you can, uh, if I can find my pointer. So if someone put in a chemical name, uh, they, they put in their chemical name they then go and do a, a hazard assessment. If they said uh, chemical A under this one, okay, it's, uh, it's automatically put the chemical name in there. They go to section two of their safety data sheet. They identify the hazard statement and it populates it for them. And uh, it also gives the uh, hazard code there. And what you can see here is it's uh, given based on different exposure routes. It's provided uh, the uh, standard uh, uh, or standardized or pre-populated uh, uh, hazard levels. It gives an overall hazard level. Uh, and then if you go back to the summary sheet, it's pre-populated the hazard level there. And then uh, if someone wanted to uh, Basically, under this, when they want to export it, they can uh, do a, a, a hit, click a button and rank from highest to lowest hazard and then export that as a Word document. Uh, and that's pretty much what people can do uh, with. And so, so it's basically a, a, what, it, what it is is trying to provide a simple tool that's taking sort of stuff that's in research and putting it in the hands of, of small business. And we're at the, at the moment, we're uh, trialling these versions. So if anyone's interested in trialling it and letting us know, that'd be great. So that's all. Thanks very much, Val. And thanks, yeah. everyone. Anyone with a quick question while we transition to Kevin? I guess, so are, they're not available online yet, but they can contact you yes, if they yes, want to yes. uh, trial them, if they that'd be great. to try in your workplace. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, I would like to see that. Uh, are you using from um, VLOOKUP uh, tool to get all the data out of uh, whatever you have? I mean that uh, you see, for example, I as an employee, I can write something as a chemicals, and so the tool will mention me that this this is this is in the level A of hazard. Yeah. So so yes. Yeah. So basically, the idea would be that. Uh, the workplace would sort of take take their safety data sheets uh, and then uh, create a repository of information, go through this process. They would be able to rank the hazards and then uh, rank the chemicals based on hazard and they could make that uh, that information available to employees or they can use it as, a, as an information uh, for control measures uh, and saying, well, maybe let's target our uh, most hazardous chemicals first and let's review are we uh, controlling those effectively and so so yeah it can be used as both a information uh, process for the business uh, the workplace but also as a as a connection with 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 employees as well so. I'm going to, um, since Paul started the wonderful precedent of asking for people to be involved in research, we really do need companies to help us trial the electronic version. And recruitment has been extraordinarily difficult. 
if you know a company that will just trial this for us and give us some feedback on its ease, because we are using their feedback all the time, please will you contact me well sometime today. Desiree I'm Desiree. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. And Thank Dr. You. Thomas, thanks Thank very you. much. Thanks very much. Um, so what size companies? Um, how big or small? We know but I think the actual question was whether it would, by typing in the chemical, pull out all the information and know the people have to go read their health and safety data sheet, yeah, find the, um, and, but then yeah. it's pre-filled with all the hazard statements. And so you just go through the drop-down menu, put in the hazard statement, and then it will code it into the yeah, ranking. So, or, yeah, yeah. So I suppose so, the, yeah, the, the process was to sort of, I suppose, force people to go back to their safety data sheets yes. and read those and Good take idea. the information out of that uh, versus, uh, but, but obviously once this is set up, uh, uh, a, a, an employee could go and do a search and see what, what's provided there for, what's already done for them, what's mm -hmm. coded, but, mm -hmm. but it doesn't sort of, it, you, it doesn't have the process of sort of putting in a chemical name and it populating it. It's the process was to, uh, uh, because there's just so many, where, where do you start and how do you do that? So, so it was really at a small business level to start with getting them to sort of really consolidate their uh, chemical safety procedures and to uh, take the information out of their safety data sheets uh, and use it as a... Uh, and because most of the workplaces we've talked with have said, we've got, lot, you know, got hundreds of chemicals, but we couldn't, we couldn't probably name the top... 10 worst ones here like or we could we would think that they're the worst ones but we have no sort of uh, way of actually really sort of uh, describing why we describe why we think that and so this gives them a way to do that okay thanks thanks, thanks Thomas okay I'm going to introduce uh, Kevin Hedges who's an occupational hygienist uh, in our Ottawa clinic and he's going to talk about some of the um, control banding tools that are out there in the world and how functional they can be for anyone's workplace. So do you know how to find it or I'll go find it? Oh, I guess I just can't seem to see my mouse right now. Oh, because it's, oh, we might need help. I don't know how to uh, move it back to the other screen. Come in. Do an escape, I guess. On our way. Hang on it's there. Because Bill. they've Runaway. created another uh, another screen. There you go. Okay. Yep. Okay. Kevin Hedges okay. control banding. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. I think Thank we, you. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for. Uh, Hanging out, um, we're running late. We've got a, a morning tea coming up, so I'm going to try and keep this brief. Um, really, I've only got probably about 10 minutes to go through a few slides here, so I really want to provide a snapshot. Um, and I snuck a logo up there on the top right-hand corner, um, Workplace Health Without Borders, and I just want to uh, acknowledge some people in the room that have presented through Workplace Health Without Borders, Dr. T. Duodati, Dr. Hugh Davies, um, and also we've got a couple of uh, founding members here, Dr. O. Malik and Marianne Levitsky there. Um, we're having a, m a meeting tomorrow at five o'clock and we're having a doctor from BHP Billiton talking about how they've reduced um, exposures to diesel particulate matter for a, a multinational mining company. So that's what we do. We try and share good practice. Is, and this subject feeds nicely into what Workplace Health Without Borders is all about. And I really want to talk, I want to give you a bit of a snapshot and overview of both um, exposure banding and control banding, because there is quite a difference between the two. And a lot of the time, you know, with the novel compounds, new, new things that are out there like engineered nanomaterials, we really don't know what the health effects are. So, you know, control banding is really useful when we don't know what the harm is. And typically, you know, with traditional occupational hygiene, you know, where as a hygienist, a young hygienist, you chase people around with a pump. You say, please wear this pump. I want to measure what you're being exposed to. Um, but if you think about the exposures uh, being log normally distributed, there's quite a range of exposures for a worker. 
Um, and then you, so they log, what they call log normally distributed. Um, and if there's a high degree of variability, you really need to take a lot of samples to get an accurate picture of exposure. And then what about small to medium-sized enterprises, the small operations that can afford um, to measure their exposures for their workers, bringing a consultant, spending money on monitoring rather than on the controls to reduce exposures. Oops. And you know, when you look at the number of occupational exposure limits out there compared to the number of chemicals, there's really less than about 5% occupational exposure limits for all of the chemicals. So, you know, to do monitoring, we really need to compare the exposure to an occupational exposure limit. But what if there's no occupational exposure limit? So the little orange piece of the pie there, that's the number of occupational exposure limits and the blue piece is the number of chemicals used without occupational exposure limits. So really, we're, there's a, I talk about a new paradigm, but control banning's been around since the 90s, so I'm not talking about anything that's new here. Um, so NIOSH have actually produced a document around exposure banning, and I don't have a lot of time, so I won't go through the detail. I really want to provide a, a sort of a snapshot but the great thing about the NIOSH exposure banding guidance is that they're putting a lot of effort into putting um, chemicals into different exposure bands. So that it's really a lot of work done on the toxicological components around chemicals that don't have exposure limits. Um, and they also, the great thing about the NIOSH document they sort of lay out a nice process for doing a tier one assessment under REACH. So the tier one assessment means that anyone can do it, basically. It's, it's a simple way of, and as Thomas was talking about, looking at the safety data sheets and looking at the, the hazard um, for the, um, the chemical. Uh, so there is NIOSH have an e-tool that you can go through. And basically uh, puts the chemical into bands, and you can actually identify the most hazardous chemical. So I've just circled the um, the carcinogens, for example. And that's just the process. So the qualitative approach is um, you, it's it's can be used by health and safety generalist. It also applies the SOBANE approach. So John Udick will have this. Bit. So Bain approach means that the actual problem can be solved by a worker at the workplace. So it's a screening tool to basically identify the hazard, do the risk assessment and put the control in place without even having a, 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 you know, a hygienist go in and do the assessment. A control banning, it's really, um, Kosh Essentials is more about control rather than hazard identification. So if you think about risk, risk is a combination of um, the harm or the consequence, uh, that's hazard banding. And then if you build in the likelihood of exposure to the consequence and you add them together, that's risk. So Kosh Essentials actually builds on it by doing a risk assessment. Um, and the great thing about uh, Kosh Essentials is that it goes to the control approach, so it actually identifies what needs to be done to control the exposure rather than identify the hazard. And I mean, there's a wheel there that just explains how it all works, and it's very useful visual uh, representation of Kosh Essentials. So it's really looking at how much chemicals being used, the dustiness of volatility, and the actual harm of the chemical. It combines all those things together and, and it works out what the control is. And I see that um, the federal government here in Canada now have a guideline, 2018, on control banding. And they talk about general ventilation all the way down to specialist advice, and, which has to do with the level of risk. So it's a really good risk management framework. Uh, so there's some advantages there. Um, so if you think about, um, if you're a, a person and you have to approve a chemical for use on site, control banning was a great way to figure out whether or not you've got the controls in place. Can rank uh, the priority for uh, controls. 
And can you be used at the concept phase of a new project? So even before the, 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 the machine is built, you can actually figure out what the controls are required before the machine's put in place. Um, it's, and so the, uh, there's a new paper uh, with David Zork's name on it. Um, so it's a quantitative validation of the control banding nano tool. Um, so there's been a lot more research done lately to actually validate these kind of tools. I just wanted to skip you through. This is just a job that I did about 15 to 20 years ago. An engineer was asking me, Kevin, I want to build a packaging line. Um, what sort of controls do I need to put in this packaging line, the hopper for the tablets being fed in, which are uncoded? Um, and so I basically took the process through the Koch algorithm and um, took the information from the safety data sheet started the assessment, transferring uh, one active pharmaceutical ingredient, sodium alendronate it was. Um, then I picked out what the hazard statement was, hazard statements were, and then um, looked at the level of control. So it said I need, this was a, a D hazard, and I was uh, looking at a small amount, because there were kilograms of tablets, but the number, it was really grams when it came down to the active pharmaceutical ingredients. And then basically it was telling me that I needed local exhaust ventilation. So then um, the engineer could design um, the equipment using localised exhaust ventilation. And I just want to go back to NIOSH and something that came out of a control banding workshop. NIOSH noted excess rates of lung disease and obstructive lung disease and obstru sorry, obstructive lung function abnormalities. And it said if industry had followed the Koch Essentials model, enclosure and containment would have most likely eliminated or reduced the, the health effects. So just going back to the talk about um, the packaging line and what we were finding other plants around the world with similar packaging lines, uh, there were reports back of nosebleeds. And so had they used the Koch Essentials control banding approach, they wouldn't have been nosebleeds. Um, we talked about perfect being the enemy of the good. Um, I've been at a few control banding workshops now, and uh, you know most people seem to argue about the accuracy of it rather than the benefits of screening and actually preventing, um, you know, occupational disease. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot, Kevin.